Hello and welcome to The Morning Seed, episode number three. The inspiration behind such a project comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, one through six. The idea, if you were to read there, you would see a repeated phrase, for we do not know, for we do not know, for we do not know the activity of God. As Solomon, the writer of that book, would write that uh, letter to, uh, for those of his audience, for his listeners, they would understand when they get to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, 1 through 6, that they don't know the activity of God. You can't predict the outcomes of life. You can't predict the success of those things. And so Solomon says in verse number six of chapter 11, Ecclesiastes, sow the seed in the morning as well as in the evening. And that's exactly what we, we are doing, but in a spiritual sense. It is the morning. It is around 10 a.m. And we are sowing the morning seed with these lessons, a lessons about how to avoid obey the gospel, what to do to become a Christian. We can't predict the outcomes of these things. We can't predict the success of something like this. But for those who are hearing these videos, we pray that it is successful. We pray that it is going to be a positive outcome. And let's get right to it. This is The Morning Seed, episode number three. We've already covered episode one and episode two. So if you did not know that, go back to those things. They are in a way lengthy, but there needed to be some explanation of scriptures connecting the dots with verses going together to bring a great interpretation of the word of God and studying those questions. And so just go back to episode one and episode two, and then come back to this episode, episode three, the morning seed. Let us review from episode one and episode number two. In episode one, we explored, we answered the question, what does it mean to obey the gospel? That comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 8. What does it mean to become a Christian, to become a disciple of Christ? Because we made the point that a disciple and a Christian, or at least asking that question, what is it, what is a Christian? They are the same thing based off of Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the first disciples were called Christians. And so Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20 answers such a question. That is how one becomes a Christian, immersion and teaching. So we saw the same thing in how to obey the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Paul says you need to obey that. How do we do that? We reenact that. And we went to Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4, and we saw the same word there as was appearing in Matthew chapter 28, baptism, 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 immersion. We looked in Acts a little bit. There, That word was popping up again. So we explored that. We had to explore that because that was a similar concept that, we, that, that kept popping up. So that was episode two. We defined what that was. It is his blood. We looked at the effects of that as far as when baptism is mentioned or when his blood is mentioned. And then it says something about sanctifying you, forgiving you, releasing you of your sins. That's what it is. And so, especially Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and also Acts chapter 2 verse 38. It talked about this idea of, okay, when you repent, when you are baptized or his blood is mentioned... Acts chapter 2 verse 38 says, you will receive forgiveness of sins. And then Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 says something very similar, something along the lines of, you will be released by your sins all because of his blood. So you just have these two passages that talk about this idea of my sins are forgiven. When I do those things, my sins are released from me. The idea of I'm in bondage to my sins. So now I have been released and it's all because of his blood. So you see this word sin, 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 sin. It's a three letter word. We read it all the time. We see it all the time. But do we truly understand what that is? Do we truly understand the reality of that? Do we truly understand what it does to me? And so sometimes when we say or someone asks the question, what is sin? Some of us will say, well, it means to miss the mark. It's like the common definition of that word sin. And I don't think that's wrong. 
I don't think it's wrong to define that word to miss the mark because you kind of have the picture of like a dartboard. And if you don't understand the concept of that game, you know, you just have these three little dot, dots or darts, I should say. And there's there's this dot in the middle and you're trying to throw it at the middle. That's called the, the bullseye. But sometimes we don't hit the bullseye. Sometimes we hit around the bullseye. We don't hit the target. We miss it. We miss the mark. And so we relate that idea to sin. Again, I don't think that's wrong. But I think there are other Bible verses that will give us, we would say, a maybe clearer answer to that question. What is sin? And there is four passages in mind when it comes to this question, what is sin? Because if we can clearly define what is sin, then we can understand, Acts chapter 2 verse 38, what exactly is being forgiven. If we can clearly understand the word sin, then we can fully understand what is being released Okay, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. So here's where I want us to begin. Passage number 1, how do we define sin or how does the Bible define sin? It's Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Romans 14, verse 23. I have my Bible here. I hope that you have your Bible there or some form of Bible, whether it's a electronic Bible or a hard copy Bible. But we're going to go to Romans 14, Verse 23, the first passage that helps us define, answer the question, what is sin? Romans 14, verse 23. Notice what the Word of God says to us this morning. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith, here it is, is sin. Pretty clear. Whatever is not from faith, that is sin sin. But maybe you're wondering, what does that phrase mean? What is not from faith? What does that really mean? Well, just back up. I think all you need to do is just back up a little bit to verse 22, just the previous verse. Verse 22, it says, the faith which you have, he's telling this church in Rome, you have this, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. You have this idea just right here in verse 22. He who, he approves, the individual approves. And this idea of verse 22 of having your own conviction before God. In the context of Romans 14, just like and kind of like 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you have this idea of eating meats or eating vegetables. You have this weak brother. You have this strong brother. A strong brother believes something like this. Weak brother believes something like this. The strong brother needs to understand what makes the weak brother stumble. So you have that situation once again right here in Romans 14. Paul says, strong brother, you believe this. But you you need to understand the weak brother has his own conviction, verse 22, about eating vegetables or about eating meats. And so therefore, you don't need to tempt him into eating something that he thinks or maybe she thinks is a sin because now you are creating a stumbling block. You are a stumbling block. You are setting yourself up as a judge. You can go back to the very beginning of chapter 14 and just notice this. Chapter 14, we can start in verse number one. It says, now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinion. So it's just his opinion or her opinion about what he thinks is a sin or not a sin to the eating of such things. Verse 2, one person has faith, so it's his own conviction, that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Well, why would that person only eat vegetables? Because that's just his own conviction. That's just his own opinion. So therefore, the person who believes, no, I'm only supposed to eat vegetables. I'm not supposed to eat meats because if I eat meats, I believe that's a sin. Okay, then that's fine. That is your opinion. And then whoever says, whoever has the opposite opinion said, no, you can eat vegetables and meats and you'll be fine in the eyes of God. Okay, well, that's just, that's your opinion. 
but brother or sister so-and-so has a different opinion than you do. So you just need to respect. You still need to accept him. You need to still acknowledge, hey, that person doesn't think like you. So verse three, the one who eats. See, do you see that common idea? The one who. So we're still talking about this idea of, okay, there are people who have different opinions, different convictions about things. So verse three, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who, see there it is again, the one who does not eat and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats for God has accepted him. So you just still have this play on the words of he who this, he who that. And so going all the way down, to verse number 12, he says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Verse 13, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. So there are some things a brother is convicted about that maybe another brother is not totally convicted about. Totally fine. But these are opinions Keep this in mind. These are opinions that people have that God has not said anything about, such as eating certain foods. God hasn't really designated, hasn't really clearly said, this is what you should eat as a Christian versus, nope, this is what you should not eat. God says, I'm going to leave that up to the individual. Leave it up to the Christian. Okay, that is his opinion, his judgment, his own conviction. So we go back down to verse 23 of Romans 14, and Paul says, look, whatever is not from faith, it is sin to you. So here's what we would say based off of the context in verse 23 of what sin is and how the Bible defines sin. Sin is violating one's conscience. That's what we could say. Based off of Romans 14, verse 23, in its context, sin is violating one's own conscience. If I know I shouldn't do something, yet I do it anyway, I have just sin. Paul says, or I should say the Bible says, that kind of a sin Acts 2 verse 38, that's the kind of sin that's forgiven. That's the kind of sin that has been released from us, Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. But let's continue because we're going to go to a second passage that will help us define the word sin. Let us go to James. The book of James, James chapter 4, James chapter 4 and verse 17. James chapter 4 verse 17 Notice what this says, James chapter 4, verse 17. The Bible says, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So we have it clearly stated. Whoever knows the right thing to do, if they don't do it, to him and his sin. It kind of sounds like Romans 14, verse 23, but really not. We could simply put it, put it like this. Okay, number one, sin is violating one's conscience. That is a sin. Number two, disobedience is a sin. Disobedience is a sin because I know what to do. I know the right thing to do. I don't do it though. So therefore, it's a sin. Disobedience is a sin. But right here, we have this idea. Maybe you've heard of this too. You have sins of omission, and then you have sins of commission. The idea is this. I know what the Word of God says, but I omit it. I refuse to do it. Intentionally, I'm not going to do anything, it says. It's a sin. Commission, I'm living the life as a Christian. I'm being faithful to the best of my ability, but I'm still human. I'm not perfect like God is. I'm going to slip along the way. I may not know I've slipped, but that's still sin. So James has this in mind. Therefore, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. But let's get the context right because that's so important as Bible students. What is the right thing to do? What is the disobedient thing that James has in mind according to the context of James chapter 4? I think we can answer such a question if we go to the beginning of James chapter 4. Look at the beginning of James chapter 4, starting in verse number 1. What is the source of your quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. 
You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Goes right into verse 4 saying, you adulteresses. Uh-oh, here's the disobedient thing right here. Do you not know that your friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's the disobedient thing right there. That part is the sin that Christians can't get, get cannot get caught up in. So whoever is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. You're not a friend of God. So then maybe we ask the question, Okay, well, how do I become a friend of God so that I don't become an enemy of God? How do I become his friend? I think this is pretty cool. Maybe something you've never seen before. But if you go back to James chapter 2, James chapter 2 verse 23, notice what it says. James 2 verse 23. It's in the middle of a thought, but that's okay. It says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So he mentions this idea of friend of God, Abraham, that's what he was. Why was Abraham labeled such a thing? It's because here's a great equation for James chapter two here, at least in this part of James chapter two. Abraham, and also he would mention Rahab too, because she falls in line as well. Here's a, good, a great equation. Faith plus works, works of obedience. Faith plus works of obedience equals justification. That's Abraham. Faith plus works of obedience equals justification. In the eyes of God, God looks at you in such a way that says, just as if you have never sinned. Why is that? Because Abraham and Rahab and the others had faith and they had obedience. Therefore, they are justified, verse 23. Therefore, Abraham is called the friend of God. Do you want to be called the friend of God? You have faith and you have obedience. Therefore, God's not going to look at you, James 4, chapter, James 4, verse 4. He's not going to look at you as an adulteress or an adulterer as far as being friends with the world. He's going to see you as a friend of God. But I think you can also further that point and you go back to James chapter 4 and notice this, James chapter 4, verse 7. Here's the right thing to do. Here's how you also become a friend of God and not a friend of the world. James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Doesn't that sound like the right thing to do there? Doesn't that sound like... Yep, I need to do that so that I don't disobey because disobedience is a sin, verse 17 of James 4. We continue, verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Yep, that makes sense. That's, that's how you do not become disobedient to God. Verse 8, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. The idea there is take sin Seriously? Verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Verse 11, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judger or but a judge of it. Those sound like those are the things that are the right thing to do. And if I do those things, I'm not falling under disobedience to God. And therefore, it's not going to be a sin. Therefore, I'm going to be viewed in the eyes of God as a friend, as his friend, as a justified person. But for those who are friends with the world, they don't do those things in verse 7 through 11 of, of James chapter 4. An enemy of God doesn't do those things. A friend with the world doesn't do those things. And therefore, that's disobedience. Verse 17, therefore, that person is sinning. So we could say, number one, sin is violating one's conscience. Number two, sin is disobeying, disobedience. But now let's go to this. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, look at verse number 4. Here's the third passage that helps us define what is a sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4, and here's what it says. 1 John 3, verse 4, everyone who practices sin 
also practices lawlessness and sin, very clearly here, is lawlessness. Breaking God's law, that is a sin. I think you can add the idea of even disobeying the laws of the land, but there's probably needs to be a little disclaimer here, a side note when I say that statement, because we know that some of the laws of the land, or at least maybe we'd also say some of those laws are that are fixing to be a law or a, a policy is fixing to be a law, some of those laws are not the laws of God. That totally needs to be noted, right? And therefore, we would not submit to such a thing, but that's a different topic for another day. But we're just noting the fact some of the laws of the land, we would throw the example of speeding, you know, speeding. Some of the laws of the land are also the laws of God. And if we disobey that too, then we are under sin. We have sinned. We have committed a sin. Why is sin considered lawlessness? Well, go down with me to verse number 8. Verse number 8 of 1 John chapter 3. Here is why sin is considered lawlessness. Verse number 8 of chapter 3 of 1 John. The one who practices sin, look at that, is of the devil. That's why. That's why sin is considered lawlessness because sin is of the devil. Sin belongs to the devil. The devil is the reason why sin exists in this world. So then, verse 9 of 1 John chapter 3, no one who is born of God practices sin. You know why sin is seen, considered, needs to be considered as lawlessness? It's not just because it is of the devil, but the habit of sin, living a lifestyle of sin. When you do that, it, di it displays that you are not of God. Therefore, that's why sin is considered lawlessness. So, number one. Sin is violating one's conscience. Number two, sin is disobedience to God. Number three, sin is lawlessness. And then here's number four, the last passage. You stick in this book, 1 John chapter 5, and look at verse 17. 1 John chapter 5, verse 17, the fourth passage that helps us understand what sin is and how the Bible defines sin. 1 John chapter 5, verse 17, it says, All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not leading to death. So he basically says everything that's not right, morally right, everything that's not righteous, it's sin. Every bit of it is sin. But maybe you're wondering too, verse 17, that last part, there is a sin not leading to death. The idea is the repentant sin, the penitent person, if that person truly repents, He's not, he or she is not going to go into spiritual death. I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, probably another side note to this point. Verse 16, you back up to just verse 16. It says, if anyone sees his brother, so we have a Christian here, committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask God and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. So this individual, this Christian brother, and I think it's also implied or a Christian sister, that if they are truly repentant, they're working hard at it, they're trying to repent, they're working hard at it, trying to be faithful, everything's okay. Everything's okay. God's okay. It says God will give him life to those who commit sin, not, not leading to death. But then he says, verse 16, there is a sin not leading to death, or sorry, there is a sin leading to death, spiritual death. And then this is pretty strong words, isn't it? Verse 16, I do not say that he should make requests for this, the request of a prayer, kind of a harsh words, but it just goes to the seriousness of sin. Sin can bring you to death. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is disobedience with God. Sin is saying and choosing sin is being friends with the world. James chapter four, you're not friends with God. So that's why John here is making a strong request about, look, there's a difference between how we treat an individual who is practicing sin, but that sin is not leading to death, not spiritual death. But then there's a brother, maybe, who is practicing sin, and that sin is going to lead to death. So then we need to handle, we need to address that issue. But we're making the point here, and what, in light of what we're talking about, that verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. Everything that's not right, right according to what God has said is right, all of it is sin.
So recap. Number one, sin is violating one's conscience. Number two, disobedience is a sin. Number three, sin is lawlessness. Number four, all unrighteousness is sin. Okay, let's get that question out of the way because now we need to explore this. Well, then what does sin do to me? If sin is going to be forgiven, right, the sin of disobedience, lawlessness, all unrighteousness, if sin is going to be forgiven, Acts 2 verse 38, it's going to be released from me by his blood, Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, okay, that's great. I think you and I would both agree that is fantastic news. It That stuff needs to happen. It needs to be forgiven. It needs to be released from us. We cannot be in bondage to that. Well, why does it need to be forgiven? Why does it need to be released from us? It's because of what sin does to us, what it can do to a person. So then what does sin do to such a person? Great question, and therefore let's answer it. Number one, what sin does to us, why it needs to be forgiven, why it needs to be released from us is because, number one, it separates us from God. That's why. It's because sin separates us from God. Let's throw a scripture at this point. It's Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59 is where you can find this point. Isaiah 59. And you look at verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Here's what it says. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. Here it is, verse 2. But your iniquities, sins, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Wow. Look how powerful sin can be in one's life. Look what sin can do to an individual. Separate you from God. He's going to hide his face from you because God cannot look at sin. It should bring to remembrance of the thought when Jesus was on the cross and he said that statement, God, why have you forsaken me? It's because at that moment in time, the sin of the world was upon the Son of God's shoulders and therefore God could not look at his son. He turned his face away from that. He could not look at his son for just a couple of moments. Because that's where sin was, right there. God cannot look at sin. The same thing with us. This is what sin does to us. Sin separates us from God to the point where he's going to hide his face from us, verse 2, so he does not hear. But we have to make this point, going back to verse number 1, the Lord's hand is not so sure that it cannot save. He wants, he wants you to be saved. Verse 1, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. He wants to hear you. But you need to understand the impact of your sin, what it can do to you. That's why it needs to be forgiven, Acts 2, verse 38. That's why it needs to be released from you, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Let's look at another passage. John, John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 34. John chapter 8, verse 34. Here's what also sin is going to do to us. John chapter 8, verse 34. It says, Jesus answered them, talking to the Jews here. You can see that back in verse 31. John 8, verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. So sin is, number one, it separates me from God. Number two, sin can enslave me. That's what sin can do to you. It can enslave you. But I think this is pretty cool here. Because then, in verse 35, it's going to say, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So then, verse 36, If the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So sin enslaves you, but in order to be set free from that enslavement, it's the son. It's Jesus. He is the one that sets you free. That's why we said his blood, Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, his blood releases you. He sets you free from the bondage of sin because sin can enslave you. I think it's pretty interesting when John, Jesus too, makes this point about the idea of the son can make you free and you're going to be free indeed. He just mentioned a similar concept about being free. If you back up to verse 31, he says, if you continue 
continue in my word, verse 31, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Do you see that? Do you see how in verse 32, he says the truth is going to make you free? And then going down to verse 36, he says the son makes you free. The truth and the son are the exact same thing, which is why Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth. And that's why Jesus says the son makes you free. He will release you. His blood will release you from your sins because your sins can enslave you. It can also separate you from God. Let's look at number three. Number three. Let us go to Romans. Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six and verse 23. I think this is a pretty well-known passage, but Romans chapter 6, verse 23, let's examine it. We have sin separates us from God. Sin is going to enslave us. And then Romans 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Number three, what can sin do to me? It will bring spiritual death. That's what it is. It will bring spiritual death death. That is why Paul has been saying in this chapter, you have got to die to your sin because it will lead to your spiritual death. You have got to die to it in this life, which goes back to what is the gospel? Death, burial, resurrection of Christ. You have got to obey that. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8. How do I obey such a thing, Paul says? Paul says you go to Romans 6, 1 through 4, and you die to your sin just like Christ died. You, you, you get buried with Christ just how Christ was buried, and you rise up out of the water, rise up out of the watery grave of baptism, just like how Christ has rose from the dead three days later. That's exactly what you do. Notice he's been saying this. If you go to verse, let's say verse 10, verse 10 of Romans 6, he says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin. See, there it is but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. You've got to die to your sins. That's why he says back in verse 3 of Romans 6, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? That's the part of dying to your sin. You get immersed in into his death so that you can be set free. Notice verse 6, verse 6 of Romans 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. See, same concept of dying to your sin. Why is that, Paul? Verse 6, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be, look at that, slaves to sin. We just looked at that, didn't we? In John chapter 8, verse 34. So that we're no longer slaves to that. Verse 7, for he who has died is freed from sin. We just looked at that, right? In John chapter 8, verse 34. See, Paul says, die to your sin. You've got to die for die to your sin. And how you do that is immersion, baptism, episode 2 of this video series project. Because, verse 23, the wages of sin is going to bring forth spiritual death. Because you were a slave of sin. John chapter 8, verse 34. And because you kept being a slave of sin, guess what? Sin kept separating you farther and farther away from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. But those are the sins, and that is why sin needs to be forgiven. Acts 2, verse 38. That is why sin needs to be released from you. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5. Let's look at one more. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, look at verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Notice what this says. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Here's what sin's going to do to you as well. Chapter 3, verse 13. He says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the, here it is, deceitfulness of sin. That's what sin can do to you. 
It can separate you. It can enslave you. It can bring forth spiritual death, but it can also deceive you. It can lie to you. It can lie to you in such a way that says, oh, everything's okay. You're enjoying life. Life is good. It can lie to you. Here's something you need to understand about this passage right here, just in case it is not clear. You notice how it says in verse 13, and it's in quotes, it says the word today, as long as it is still called today. Why is it worded that way? Because notice that the Hebrew writer is getting that word today from an Old Testament passage, an Old Testament passage in which he just previously mentioned. Go back to verse 7. Go back to verse 7 of chapter 3 of Hebrews. He says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, see that right there? Today, that's what he said in verse 13, but stay in verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So not only does he mention in verse 13 this idea of today, but notice in verse 13 it says, so that none of you will be hardened. He said that also back in verse number 8. Do not harden your hearts. This Old Testament passage is Psalm 95, 7 through 11. Psalm 95, 7 through 11. Why is the Hebrew writer bringing this up? Because he's communicating to this audience saying, look, you know the Israelites? They heard his voice. They heard it. And guess what they did with it? They hardened their hearts. Their hearts were unbelieving. Their hearts went astray. So the result is, as the Hebrew writer is going to say, they did not get to enter into his rest, for, which for them was the promised land. Some of them didn't get to enter into that rest. And the Hebrew writer says, likewise, if you harden your heart, which means you refuse to listen to the voice of God, if your heart is hardened, you have an unbelieving heart, deceitfulness of sin is when that's all taking place, the result of having a hardened heart, guess what that means for you as well? You cannot enter the eternal rest. Like some of those Israelites did not get to enter to the rest of the promised land. That's how powerful sin is. It can lie to you. It can say, oh, it's okay. You don't need to listen to the voice of God. It's all right. Listen to this other God, the God of what we just looked at, the God of sin, enslavement of sin, right? John chapter 8, verse 34. It's okay. Everything's all going to be good. But the Hebrew writer says, that's why, verse 13, you need to encourage one another day after day, encouraging them to listen to the voice of God. And the voice of God is, today for us, is listening to the words of Jesus because it goes back to chapter 1, verse 1. In these last days, he has spoken to us by a son. Son applies to Jesus. You listen to his voice today so that your heart is not hardened, so that your heart does not become unbelieving, so that your heart is not straying away from God. Because in that moment again, that's when sin is deceiving you. This is what sin can do to you and to me. Deceive me, enslave me, bring me spiritual death, and separate me from God. That is why Acts 2 verse 38, sin needs to be forgiven. That is why sin needs to be released from you, Revelation chapter 1 verse number 5. We looked at what is sin. We looked at what sin can do to us. Now let's look at this, the last question of the day, the last point of the day. How do I get out of sin? How in the world do I get out of sin then? Man, if that's what sin can do to me, man, I need to get out of it. And that's exactly right. We need to get out of it. So then how do we get out of it? I've been quoting it a lot, or at least mentioning it, but we need to turn there. Acts 2 verse 38. That's going to tell us how to get out of sin, along with other passages, of course. But we start right here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, because I want to point something out to you, maybe something you haven't noticed before, even though we've turned to this passage when we went to and explored the idea of baptism, immersion, but we're going here for a different point, of course. So go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is how we get out of sin. Acts 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter preaches that along what he says in verse 39, but then notice verse 41. Verse 41 of Acts 2, he says, so then 
Those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So this crowd, some of them, listened to the preaching of Peter. They listened to his words. But notice that part in verse 41. Those who had received his word, they received Peter's sermon into their minds and hearts. Could we not say that's a form, an idea of repentance? Yes, they were baptized. We see that in verse 41. But I want you to notice that because if they don't receive his words, receive Peter's sermon, then they're not going to get baptized because he said in Acts 2 verse 38, you first got to repent and then be baptized. It's not like the other way around where you get baptized and then you repent. First, you get repentance. And repentance can be defined in such a way that says, okay, I'm going to receive the word of God, you know, into my mind and into my heart heart and that's going to plant this seed of okay now i got to get immersed because of what can sin do to me separate me enslave me bring forth spiritual death deceive me that's what repentance receiving the word of god but watch this watch this go down to verse number 42 Verse 42, just go to the next verse down. Verse 42, they, so those who received this word, those who were immersed, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That's a form of repentance, isn't it? Not Not just this idea of receiving his word, but look at their actions, right? Look what they're doing all in verse 42. And not just that, look at verse 46. It says, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They're enjoying meals together as Christians. They were taking meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, so on and so forth. Could we not say that's a description, a demonstration of repentance, right? I think we could say that. Because here's how we need to define repentance, which, by the way, we asked that third question, how does one get out of sin? It's repentance. That's what it is. It's repentance. It's not baptism, even though baptism forgives us of our sins, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. But here's why I say it's not baptism. It's because I'm not saying that we we don't ever get baptized because that's why we covered it in episode 2 or lesson number 2. Go back and watch that. What I'm saying is this. Every time I sin, right? Because we said sin is violating one's conscience. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is disobedience. All unrighteousness is sin. Every time I'm sin, I'm not going to always go to the church building and get into the water and ask somebody, hey, you got to immerse me again because I just sinned. That's not it. We don't need to do that. We need to do that when we acknowledge, okay, I'm a bad individual or I'm a sinful individual. I need to get into the kingdom of God, you know, so on and so forth with that kind of thinking. But after when I become a Christian is what I'm talking about. After I become a Christian, I've done all that stuff. I'm going to continue to mess up in life because I'm just not a perfect person. We may note of that earlier. I'm not a perfect person, but when I mess up, remember sins of omission, sins of commission, when I mess up, the commission sins, I'm living faithfully. I'm doing the best of my ability. But because I'm not perfect, I'm just going to slip up every now and then. And therefore, I don't need in those moments to always go to the church building or go to a pool or something like that and call upon somebody and says, hey, you need to immerse me again because I just sinned. And then the next couple hours later, it's like, hey, you need to come back out here. You need to immerse me again because I just sinned. No, no, no. Bible doesn't teach that. He says, you want to just get out of sin? Repentance. That's what it is. It's repentance. That's what helps you get out of sin. And their way of repentance, Acts 2, verse 41, 42, and 46, is seen in those kind of descriptions and what it says. So here is what we can form a definition of repentance. Here's our definition. Here's what I think a definition of repentance is. Because sometimes we say it's it's to change your mind. And I, I don't think I have a problem with that. But I think I want to further that, just sharpen it up a little bit. And I would say something like this. Repentance is a change of mind leading to a change of action. I think that's how I would sharpen it up a bit. It's a change of mind leading to a change of action. And what I just showed you, that definition fits right into Acts chapter 2. Because in verse 41, it says they received his word. They changed, the, they changed their mind about that. They changed their mind to say, I'm going to receive what Peter just said to me. And then that led to their change of actions. What were their, how did their actions change? Well, verse 42, look what they're doing all in verse 42. Look what they're doing in verse 46 and verse 47. Their actions are changing because they changed their mind about what Peter said. What did Peter say? 
Verse 36, he's trying to prove that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Christ, the Messiah. He's, he's trying to prove that. That's what he was preaching. And then he told them in verse 38 to repent and be baptized. They changed their mind about that, what Peter said. And therefore, they changed their actions. They're now living the life of a repentant Christian, an immersed Christian. And the question is, too, I think, what are they changing their mind about? Not just what Peter said, but remember what Peter told them in, their, in his sermon? If you go back to verse 23, 23 of Acts 2, it says, This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. That's what they needed to repent of. He said, you nailed him to the cross. That is what you need to repent of. That's what you need to repent. You need to change your mind about that so it can lead to change of actions. And that's when they received his words, verse 41. And here's their actions. They're changing, verse 42. Their actions are changing, verse 46 and verse 47. That's it. That's why I say repentance needs to be defined as something like this. A change of mind leading to a change of action. That's how one gets out of repentance and one needs or gets out of sin. That's how one needs to repent. Because look what sin can do to you. Enslave you, separate you, deceive you, bring forth spiritual death. You've got to constantly, daily repent. That's what a Christian does in one's life. It's a daily practice. Repentance is a daily practice of a Christian, or at least it needs to be. You know how I know that? Because Acts chapter 2, verse 46, I think would prove that. Because you notice how it says day by day. That's every single day they were doing these things. Verse 42, it says they were continually, every day, all the time. That's a practice of repentance. It's a daily practice of repentance. That's exactly what that is. And you know what these early Christians are also displaying? Is what Paul calls in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 10 through 11. They're practicing what we would call, what Paul would call, godly sorrow. That's what they're practicing. Godly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is the idea of, oh man, I'm sorry I got caught. That's not really true repentance. True repentance is every single day. Changing my mind so it can lead to a change of actions. Again, that's stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 10, and 11. That is godly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to salvation is what Paul says. It leads to salvation. What happens then if repentance is not a daily practice in the Christian life? What's going to happen if repentance is not a daily practice in the Christian life. Well, here comes eternal destruction, right? Here it comes. And here's a passage that can prove that. Go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And notice this. 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 9, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, here is what's going to happen if repentance is not a daily practice of the Christian. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, the promise of coming back, as some count slowness. Some of those people are mentioned in verse number 3 because they're just mocking. Oh, everything's the same. God hasn't come back. Maybe there is no God. Maybe he forgot about the promise. And Peter says, no, he hasn't forgot about it. Which leads to verse 9, some count it as slow, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the opposite is this, if I do not repent, guess what's going to happen to me, verse 9 of Second Peter chapter 3, I'm going to perish eternally, I'm going to perish. And not only, Peter says, am I going to perish if I don't show a daily practice of repentance, but I'm going to perish along with the world, the physical world. Because look what he says in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away. With they roar and the elements will be destroyed. There it is, with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. 
Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? He's saying, repent. Repent so you can have this kind of behavior. So you can be holy in your conduct. So that you can be godly. Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will be or will melt with intense heat. So see, if you do not perish, your, or if you do not repent, you will perish, perish along with the world. So then that's why he says, verse 13, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Verse 14, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, looking for what? Verse 13, the new heavens and the new earth, be diligent, be faithful, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Be diligent. The idea of verse number nine Repent. Have a daily practice of that. Because if you have a daily practice of repentance, godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11, if you have a daily practice of that, guess how you're going to be found? Verse 14, peace, spotless, and blameless. Go back to verse 11. You have a daily practice of repentance before the world is destroyed, before Jesus comes back. You are holy in conduct, and you're going to be found in godliness. See, that's what it is. That's how you get out of sin. You get out of sin with repentance, a change of mind leading to a change of action. That's how you get out of it. You show godly sorrow because that's the kind of sorrow that leads to salvation. It's going to avoid eternal destruction. But if you do not have a daily practice of this, you are going to perish along with the world being destroyed. God does not want that. That's why he, he says, Peter says in verse 9 of this chapter, he's being patient toward you. That's why he hasn't come back yet. Is it okay to pray for his second coming? Yeah, I think so. I think it's fine. Even though we know there's some family members and friends who are not Christians yet. But maybe you're just one of those Christians who say something along the lines of in your prayers, Lord, please come. Please come quickly. You know, this world is so evil. It's so wicked. Please come. Even though, again, you know, in the back of your mind, uh, there's still people, though, who, are, who haven't obeyed the gospel yet. I think it's okay to pray those prayers because, you know, we're just ready to go to heaven. We're ready to go to a place where it's so perfect and so happy and so blessed. You know, all those different things. I think it's okay to pray that. I think it's okay to pray, Lord, just continue to be patient. Continue to be patient. Patient with us, patient with this world. I'm totally cool with both kind of prayers. But I'm just pointing out, if you don't show a daily practice of repentance, this is what's going to happen. And God doesn't want that. He doesn't want that. But just because Peter says in verse 9, God is patient to those so that those people can truly repent before they perish to eternal destruction. Just because Peter says he's patient doesn't mean he's going to wait for a long, 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 long time for someone to repent. Because if you go back to verse, what is it, verse 8, the idea is the Lord is one day, like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day, God operates on his timetable. He doesn't operate on our timetable, your timetable, my timetable. He operate, operates on his timetable. His timetable is so, so different than our timetable. So therefore, he can come at any minute. So he's not going to wait for a long, 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 long time for you to repent because I'm sure he's given you every opportunity to do such a thing. So that's why we got to act on it quickly. We got to act on it pretty pretty fast. Because that's the thing that's going to get you out of repentance. Because we have to realize again what we just covered. Sin is going to deceive you. Sin is going to bring forth spiritual death. Sin is going to enslave you. Sin is going to separate you from God. That is why Acts 2 verse 38, sin, your sin needs to be forgiven. That is why Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, your sin needs to be released from you. And what forgives you of your sin? What releases you from your sin? Those two passages, Acts 2 verse, Acts 2 38 and Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, it says his blood or immersion. They are the same exact thing. You need to go to episode two if you missed that connection. They're the exact same thing. That's why we have to get immersed. We have to be baptized. Going down into the water because it, it represents the blood of Christ. That's what the Ethiop Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8. We have got to do that. But we've also got to understand there is repentance involved. It's a change of mind leading to a change of action. That is exactly what we do to get out of of sin. That is what's being forgiven. That is what's being released from 
us. This has been The Morning Seed, episode number three. Sorry these are long, but it seems like we just need to do the best of our ability to explain scripture, but also to connect the dots with the things in which we are going to discuss. Again, this has been episode three, The Morning Seed, answering the questions of what is sin, what does sin do to me, and then how do I get out of sin? Next week, Lord willing, we'll be back again Saturday at 10 a.m. Bring your Bibles as we make these beautiful connections within scripture and which proves the inspiration of God. Again, thank you for tuning in, or if you're going to tune in later, really appreciate that. Always grab your Bible during this uh, video series project, because we're going to do the best of our ability, again, like I said, to make these beautiful connections within Scripture. Lord willing, we'll look at more things concerning the idea of, in Acts 2, verse 38, this idea of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit when we repent, when we get immersed. What is that all about? What does that include? And so, again, we'll explore that thought as much as we can. Again, connect Connecting the dots within scripture to help us understand, okay, when I repent, when I get immersed in the watery grave of baptism, I get forgiveness of sins, but what about that last part? What exactly does that mean? And so we'll let the Bible answer such a question and then we'll explore those kinds of a thought. Lord willing, next week at 10 a.m. Again, please consider liking and sharing this video as well as liking and sharing our page. I've been your host, Remy, or better known as Remington Afri, the youth minister at the Meadows Church of Christ right here in Beaumont in the great state of Texas. Please come see us. Please come visit us. We're at 9195 Dishman Road, 9195 Dishman Road. Sunday mornings, we worship at 9.30 a.m. We have Bible class right afterwards, 11 a.m. for all ages. And then we meet on Sunday evenings at 5 p.m. and in the middle of the week at 6.30 p.m. Again, we love for you to come see us and come visit us, to love on you, care for you, hug on you. Let me give you a couple of uh, shout-outs here, or at least one shout-out, I should probably say, that May 8th, we have a Friends and Family Day. That's May 8th, we have a Friends and Family Day at the Meadows Church of Christ building from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have all kinds of inflatables, all kinds of food that's going to be there, uh, snow cones, um, different things for little kids, kid games. And so please come see us on May 8th. That's at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we're going to do that right there at the Church of Christ building. We'd love for you to come out and come see us and come visit us. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're going to tune in later, again, this has been episode three of The Morning Seed. I've been your host, Remy, or better known as Remington Afri, youth minister at the Meadows Church of Christ right here in Beaumont in the great state of Texas. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time. Godspeed.